Morning, John. Morning, Brother Scott. Yes, I'm sorry. Good afternoon to you. I keep forgetting. <laughs> good afternoon, Brother Scott. <laughs> good afternoon and good morning to yourself. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, it's good morning to me. It's good afternoon to you. I, I keep forgetting that. Is my is my audio coming across okay? Because yep, it's a you're great. Bit of a new setup here, so uh, I've adjusted my music setup to to be able to come across a little bit more clearly today. Yeah, hey, uh, I've got a filter to take care of the accent, but I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> How make are you doing, sound, Chris? We're gonna make you sound like a Texan. A hey, Texan. y'all! This is Scott. Y'all. <laughs> How you doing, y'all? Yeah, nice Saturday morning. Rained a little last night, so clear right now. So. That's nice. Yeah, you're all you're all formal, but that's okay. <laughs> it's um, I, I wasn't sure on the dress code for a start, but no, okay. it's um, it's actually VE Day. It's Victory in Europe Day oh. today. Oh um, wow! So all right. As uh, I'm the the chairperson of the local British Legion over here, mm -hmm. um, on the island, so uh, we were out this morning. Hence right. the suit. Oh, okay. Yeah. Otherwise, it would normally just have been uh, sort of. Maybe smart caller. Right. But, uh, we only finished about an hour ago, so... Um, Understood. Oh, that's perfectly fine. Quick, A quick change of the tie. Put yep. on a lodge tie. Oh, there you go. <laughs> yeah. We're good I, to go. I, I at least wear uh, polos. That's as dressy as I get for these things. I make sure I don't wear a t-shirt. <laughs> I've, I've done a few... I've done a few of these, um, these presentations, and the, the dress code varies so much depending on what jurisdiction you're speaking with and right. um, there was one of the uh, one of the presentations I did they were all sitting in dinner suits wow I thought that's that's quite extreme <laughs> yeah yeah well we did have a uh, research chapter a rural arts chapter and uh, I I attended their meeting and hosted it for them because I have a zoom account and they had the free one so I was happy to provide the better service of the paid account so we could last longer and have more people in and all. And most of them were wearing their red blazers because it's customary for the Royal Arch to wear the red blazers. Right. And I'm just like this. So it's like, well, <laughs> but they actually held a meeting. The Royal Arch in Virginia is allowed to have actual meetings. They read business and whatever. They actually vote and everything. Right. Okay. Right. So whereas the lodges until recently, their Zoom meetings are totally informal. You know, yeah, we're, we're, we're the exact same in Scotland. Um, okay. In fact, at the very start of all this, they were actually very sceptical about holding any sort of Masonic meeting, be it informal or formal. Um, right. But um, they, they seem to have got on board with it a little bit more, and they're, yep. they're, uh, they're actually the Grand Lodge of Scotland have actually started hosting their own webinars um, with various historians and things to talk about Freemasonry as well. Right. So That's it's, great. It's nice to see lodges all around the world actually starting to embrace technology a little bit. I know it's been forced, <laughs> um, but I think had it not been for what's happened with the pandemic, I, I think most lodges still wouldn't even have a website, never mind right. anything else. Right. I just hope it continues. I hope that, I mean, once people yeah. like this form, we're still going to want it in some way. Well, we still want the meetings. I still can't wait to get back to regular meetings, but yeah. I still want to keep doing these and I think people who have gotten a taste for this will want to keep doing it. Even people have learned so much from it. Yeah. Um, I mean, without these meetings, I would never have been able to speak to some of the people that I've spoken to. I would never right. have met some of the people that I've met. Um, even in Scotland. I mean, I've, I've met um, members of Scottish lodges that the chances of me meeting outside of this were pretty slim. Right. You know, unless I particularly went to their lodge. Um. But yeah, it's nice. I, I like it. Yeah. It's pretty cool. I'm wondering where my uh, lovely co-host is. Brian usually is on by now. <laughs> I'm going to have to do all the work myself. <laughs> so, John, what have you been up to? Or are you on three other meetings right now? Yes, I'm afraid I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, still, I'm still doing my own business and people are trying to contact me. Oh, okay. <laughs> so is the monitor like over here for you? Because you're always looking. I've got, I've got two. Huh? I have two monitors. Oh, I see. Okay. 
because you're always looking askance when you're talking to me. I'm trying not to take it personal. Look, look at that guy. <laughs> <laughs> I totally understand. That's why I, I put my camera so it's in line with the monitor, so I'm looking forward when I'm talking yeah. instead of, you know. I mean, the most I look is that way, so. But you're like, when I see you all the time. <laughs> I, I actually have three screens in front of me at the moment, which is I, not for this. I, I only use yeah. two for this, but um, when I'm working, I can quite commonly have three screens going at the right. same time. Oh, and yeah. uh, eventually you forget what camera you're on. Right. So you, 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 look <laughs> <laughs> you need a producer. Camera two. Yes, that's, that's, right. that's exactly what I need. So did you buy the microphone for Zoom meetings and what all? I mean, you seem a little more elaborate than me. No, I um I stream as well. Um, I'm a okay. musician, so I, oh. I do a bit. I do a bit of music streaming. Um, Very cool. Okay. So this is this is just a benefit of that. It means that it can right. hopefully I come across a bit better because I've got quite a deep voice, and with my accent, it can make it quite difficult to understand at times. Right. Um. So what I've noticed by using the big mic is it makes it a little bit easier for people okay. um, that are not That's from cool. Scotland. I, I understand. Well, I've got these little cheap skull candy headphones, but I tell everybody, buy them. They're cheap. They're like $15 or more or less at like Target everywhere. I've had the same couple of pairs for years. I was in my first Zoom meeting for my last job and uh, my wife's phone had the Star Wars music on it and it was in the other room and it played and someone came up and said, are you, uh, are you watching a movie right now? That's like, no, that's my wife's phone. And it's two rooms away. You heard that? <laughs> so apparently, this is a very these are very effective mics, and so I have to worry about background noise. But I'm I'm loud to begin with. But these mics, from what I can tell, are very very effective, and for being so cheap. And I like the look that they're just really slim. I, I never got into the whole earbud thing. My wife and my son like the earbuds. I don't. Mm -hmm. I, I just like the the fit of these. I don't mind the wires. I've. I've found so many of them lying on a street. That, oh yeah. <laughs> that, I mean, that, that's, I, I, it would worry me. They're so expensive or some yeah. of them are so expensive. And they just fall. And off. honestly, I, I've found so many lying in the street. You think, well, you lose it. You lose one of them. That's you. It's yeah. a whole new set and that's another couple of hundred bucks. Right. Yeah. That's why I'm worried. These, I mean, these went out of me today. I'd just go buy a new pair. I'd be out $10. So I've got my, are you going to draw those instead? Well, we kind of like the, these. the broadcast thing you had going on. Yeah, but there we go. That's a bit better. Okay. I, don't look as, I don't look like a Cyberman from Doctor right. Who now. Morning, Brother Kurt. How are you doing? Good, Brother Christopher. How are you? I'm good. Good to have you with us. And where are good you good. coming from? Uh, Milton, Wisconsin. Oh, very good. Okay. Nice to have you here. Good to be here. I never know. Scott, I never know how many people to expect. We typically have at least 10 people. Mm -hmm. On these Zoom meetings, um, we've had as much as, I think 40 was my high watermark. I'll have to go back and check the mm -hmm. records. But if I get 20, it's a good meeting. And that's still, but consider how many countries are represented. I think we're doing pretty damn good. I've got, oh, it's got at least one Brit, one Scott, and one Canadian. Yeah. Almost every well, I think a lot of lodge meetings, if you got 20 people, you'd be over the moon. Well, that's true. <laughs> this is very true. Well, considering, I mean, we have um, our... Uh, our research lodge is hosting this and our Facebook group has like, I think almost 1600 members now. I think the majority of them, I don't know what they did. They just joined. Maybe they just joined to get the paper, but it's yeah. like, I would, if I could get, you know, 10% of them to show up at a zoom meeting, I have 160 people in here. So mm -hmm. I don't know, but we announce it, you know, I, I, I promote it well. And then I get, you know, 10 people are coming and 30 are interested. Oh, great. And I get the same 10 to 20 people. So I don't, I have no idea what to expect in a given week. <laughs> so it's a good thing that I'm not doing this to make money because I'd be going broke about now. So, well, I am, um, <laughs> I really enjoy this topic. I'm quite passionate about it. So I'm, oh, yeah. I'm quite happy to, uh, to talk to an empty room about it, to oh, be honest. And I mean, don't worry. I mean, it does go out on, um, I do put all of them on YouTube. I think I mentioned to you. So mm -hmm. they're available and people are going and watching them on YouTube. So it is, it is reaching an audience. I just like having a good crowd when you're presenting. So uh, you can get good questions at the end and all that and give some back and forth. I think that's mm -hmm. better. 
Morning, Brother Christian. How are you today? I'm doing pretty good. Thank you very much. I'm hoping uh, that this um, uh, is open to entered apprentices. Oh, certainly. Certainly. Yes. Great. I'm, I'm not restrictive. We even allow non-Masons. I'm if you're interested in masonry and you want to attend this and learn more, I have no problem with that whatsoever. So, Great, thank you. All right, good to have you. And you're from, where are you from again? Well, uh, I, my lodge is in Canada, Calgary, okay. uh, Glenbow Lodge 184, but we've relocated to Mexico. Really? Yeah. Oh, you've relocated, not your lodge. <laughs> not my lodge, yeah. Oh, oh sorry. Okay. Yeah, that'd be kind of funny if your lodge were located in Mexico. That'd be quite a trick. <laughs> <laughs> well, so let me ask you, you, I saw you, had, so you're an entered apprentice? I am an entered okay. apprentice, yeah. I, I, I noticed you're wearing a ring, though. Did, 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 I do. Well, ring? I guess that's normal uh, in, in the Calgary area. At oh, okay. Least. They've left it up to us to decide if we want to wear a ring or not. And some guys do, and other guys don't at all. Even some of the Master Masons don't wear the rings, but they've left okay. it up to us. Well, every jurisdiction is different, and that's something you learn. If you're online, any amount of time you learn quickly. Every jurisdiction is different. They yeah. all have their own. I, I like the. I made up the acronym. Uh, your jurisdiction may vary. Y M. Y J M V. Your jurisdiction may vary, and because uh, in Virginia you are not allowed to wear any sort of Masonic insignia until you're a Master Mason. Because it's the same here in Mexico as well. Okay. I, yeah, they. Uh, so I don't know if I should remove it because I'm now here and I need to follow the jurisdictional uh, rules. Uh, right. Nobody said I needed to take it off yet, but I would certainly yeah. do that if, if that was required. Yeah. Well, some would say it's misleading. Some would say you haven't earned it. But I, the thing is, like, I wouldn't bother, like, buying an entered apprentice ring if they offered one because you're only expected to be one for a short time. So, and you know, the, um, I will say, you may have guessed the, the square encompasses change from EA to fellow Master Mason. I won't mm -hmm. say more than that, but you find that out. I think you kind of figure out what, what the regular is. What? Um, hang on, hang on a sec. I think that the subject of, of rings as well is quite a heated topic at times online. Um, interestingly, it's not, it's not something that I've ever been. Uh, particularly involved in myself, I don't, um, I don't actually own any Masonic rings, um, but you see the the conversations quite a lot online, and they they always they're always so varied on what oh, way it should be, what hand should it have, be on, what way should it be worn. It started as a joke, but some people take it too seriously about points in, points out. It's like just it's kind of a thing where everybody keeps bringing it up because some people got so worked up about it, and it's I'm kind of I'm kind of over it, but you know. I know some people enjoy that, so they bring it up. Is there is there a proper way point center points out or not? Uh, okay, my opinion. I wear it so I'm not wearing it, but if you, I wear it so you see it. You see, I'm wearing yeah. a square and compass because I know what it is. That's how I do it too. I'm of the opinion, yes, that you would wear it so someone else will see mm. it on your hand. Some say it's, and that's points out. Points in is so you see it and it reminds yourself. I guess kind of like your wedding ring. It's like. Oh, I can't do that. I'm married. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's like, you know, my wife said, you know, I, I asked her once um, if I wanted to get some kind of inscription on the inside of my wedding band. And she said, yes, put, put it back on. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was just me. But anyway... <laughs> Oh yeah, but um, but the whole point is, I guess it is to remind you when you wear it. But to me, just my opinion, I've always worn them points out. Virtually everybody I know wears them points out, and that's just it doesn't make sense that you look at it just to remind you of it. I don't know. It's so the world can see it. But I don't, I don't know. You don't see, you don't see you get a you don't see someone get a like a, a square and compass on their yeah. on their bicep, you know. <laughs> when they look at it. I don't think there's an actual jurisdiction around the world that states which one should don't be think either. So. No. I don't think there's any rule whatsoever. Yeah. It's, um, I will say, I know that um, um, some, um, some jurisdictions may actually dictate it. And also, I don't think there's any one rule. Morning, Brother Lies. <laughs> um, 
I think most people on. wear it on their right ring finger on their right hand because wedding bands on the left, but people can do whatever they like. I know some guys who wear their 33rd degree next to their wedding band. There's no set rule, but you know, you, you do whatever you like, right? Brother Elias, how you been? Yeah, yeah. Sure, sure. Good to have you here. <laughs> Elias is fond of showing us his hands when he, he's always like doing this. The last meeting, that's all I saw. <laughs> it was like this. You're adjusting something constantly. Yeah, yeah. Elias and his magic hands, yes. <laughs> Thank you, dude. <laughs> oh, brother, Dave's here. Good. So, anyway, Scott, typically we just sort of, uh, you know, BS around like this for the first uh, 10 minutes or so, make sure everybody gets in. Mm -hmm. I try not to have people coming in right in the middle of your presentation because that's what seems to happen. So, you know. Yeah, I mean, it, it's not a problem. All right. I, I don't mind. Um, with uh, regards to with regards to questions, do we normally hold questions? Absolutely, sort of absolutely. Do you have an idea of roughly how long your talk is? I need to start asking that. <laughs> um, how long do you want it to be? It, it's, writ it's written to be about an hour. Okay. Uh, that's on the, a little on the long side, but not bad. I had a fellow yesterday that went, last week, I think he went well over an hour, and I didn't know when he was going to stop. So I say, uh, so um, are we getting towards... Typically, I mean, like uh, in a lodge, typically you don't want to go over 20 minutes because people are sitting, yeah. you know, um, Wait, but I don't have a set rule. I can I, skim over. I can skim over a few things. Okay. There's a couple of bits that are really interesting that yeah. I, I, mean, I tend it, to spend a bit of time on. It, um, I'll leave it to your judgment. Um, but I would yeah. say an hour is right at the outside, I would think. Okay. So we had the brother talking about Cuba and he talked for about an hour and then he got into um, his personal visit there. It went on for 20 minutes, but it was like he'd been talking about all the history. It was Brother uh, Moses Gomez, and you may have, if you're on Facebook, you've probably seen him. I was, I was very happy to get him to talk here because he's mm -hmm. a minor celebrity, at least in my world, I think. But his last 20 minutes were just about him and his family visiting Cuba and the way they were taken around. And that was totally off top. I mean, it was a qu a quite a change from everything he'd already covered, but it was so interesting. Everybody was totally into it, so no one complained. Um, I will say, though, I have had a few people say, uh, is this guy almost done? Just because people don't, it's kind of like they, they, they have a script and then they kind of expand on it because they're online. They kind of like, let me go off and explain more about this. You know what I mean? And then they're like well over an hour for a 40 minute talk. I think so the, as long as it's interesting, I'm not going to cut you off. I, I experienced a two hour question and answer session after one of oh the God. presentations. That was... Um, <laughs> And that, that was very late on for me. Um, yeah. It was about two o'clock in the morning for me. Oh, my. Well, we do um, want so, all plenty of time for questions. I mean, yeah. so. I'm, I'm, happy, I'm happy to answer questions. It's, it's that's probably nice. the most fun part of the, the entire presentation because you never really know what questions are going to be asked and what right. information is therefore going to come out. I got a question for you, Brother Scott. Where are you from? Uh, I'm from the west coast of Scotland. Um, so I live on a, a small island called the Isle of Cumbria, which is... Uh, just near Glasgow. Oh, yeah. And you're there right now? I am indeed. It explains my funny accent. <laughs> what time is it there for you? Uh, it's 10 past three at the moment in the afternoon. Oh, in the afternoon. Okay. Yeah, in the afternoon. Yeah. Okay. yeah it, it's still, Christian, it's typical. We meet at 10 o'clock East Coast time because that's where my, my research lodge meets uh, at that time. That's when I started these unstated meetings. And it works well for the Brits and the Scots because they're like three, four o'clock, even into Europe, it's only five. So we had brothers from Bulgaria, Romania, in that area, they were only like five o'clock. So it's not bad for them. It's a little unfortunate. If you're in Mexico, you're probably Central or Pacific time. So right. it's a little early for you. Oh, Elias fell out and came back in again. Uh, so this, this generally is the best time, but I have fellows come in from Hong Kong and China who drill in at like 11 o'clock at night their time. But that's their choice. Yeah. But I think my audience, it works well for this time. It's early for us, mid-afternoon for them. It, it kind of works out well for everybody. But I have made exceptions depending on who the speaker is and, and what all. Uh, Brother Aday, yeah. want to say hello before we get started? How you doing? 
Hi, how are you doing? I'm good. Fine. Good to have you. See, I got my Canadian. We're ready to go. We got a Brit, a Scott, and a Canadian. We're ready to start. Okay. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll go ahead. It's uh, about 10 after. If anybody else comes in, I'll let them in. My regular co-host isn't here to help, uh, but I'll try and watch the door best I can. Um, welcome, everyone. My name is Chris Douglas. I'm a junior deacon of Virginia Research Lodge, number 1777, in Highland Springs, Virginia. I'm in Virginia Beach, which is about an hour or so away from there. Uh, this is our weekly unstated meeting. Since we couldn't have stated meetings, I started having unstated meetings on Saturdays. And uh, today we have Brother Scott Watson from Scotland, and he'll give his introduction, uh, where he's from and all that, when I present him. Uh, thank you all for coming out. I do want to put the links up there for those of you who may not have them. We have um, our Lodge Facebook group where you're welcome to join, our Lodge website, our link to our uh, YouTube channel. It's Cigar Doug is my channel that I host all of these uh, um, meetings on YouTube after I clean them up a little and put them online, and then my email address. And if you're interested in our weekly research paper emails, they're absolutely free. You just need to message me on Facebook is the best way, or you can email me and I will sign you up. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Brother Scott, and he can go ahead and introduce himself and start his presentation. Thank you very much, Brother Chris. Um, gentlemen, brothers, it's, it's good to see you. Thank you so much for inviting me here today uh, to be part of this. Uh, as I was explaining to uh, Brother Chris just before we started there, I've, I've given a few of these presentations now uh, to various lodges all over the world. And um, it's been one of the few good things to come out of such a, a horrible situation. Uh, the fact that we can all still come together, talk about Freemasonry, talk about things that we're passionate about and, um, and meet so many interesting people as well. Uh, there's people even in Scotland that I would probably never have met before had it not been for the current situation and the fact that we're, we're having these, these, um, these Zoom calls. So for that, I'm, I'm extremely grateful. And thank you again, Chris. Um, the research papers email list is uh, one of the, the, the first things I signed up for, actually, I think, during the, uh, when the pandemic started to make sure that I was still getting my regular fix of, of Freemasonry. And uh, I, I'm very appreciative of it. Um, Chris, could you enable screen sharing, please? Okay, I think that's us. There we go. Hopefully you can all see my screen okay. Yep, see it fine. Excellent. Thank you. So my name is uh, Scott Watson. I am the Worshipful Senior Warden of Lodge Kelburn number 459 on the Isle of Cumbria on the west of Scotland. Um, we are the smallest island geographically to have a working lodge in Scotland. Um, so while there are smaller islands uh, and smaller lodges, um, we are the, the smallest island ge geographically to have a, a working lodge. There's only one town, it's the town of Melport. Um, and I have been a Freemason now for just over 15 years. I was in the Royal Air Force for 10 years and uh, I had become a, an entered apprentice. I was made an entered apprentice and then I, I, I went away down south, um, down to Gloucester and Cornwall uh, down in England. And that sort of uh, slowed down my, my progression through Freemasonry because I wasn't back home as often as I would like. And uh, unfortunately, didn't really tie in very well with uh, the midweek meetings. So um, it wasn't until I actually came back from my service in the Air Force that I then progressed with my Freemasonry. And I'm very lucky that my mother lodge, Lodge Kelburn, um, welcomed me back with open arms, as you would expect from a, a Masonic lodge. And I've been very fortunate to, to progress through the various offices um, as, as an office bearer within Lodge Kelburn. So the, the plan was, uh, God willing and brethren willing, that I would have gone into the chair and become the right worshipful master of Lodge Kelburn, uh, possibly last year. But with everything that's going on, that's that's been um, 
sort of slowed down a little bit and uh, we're not quite sure what will happen in the future but at some point I, I do hope to uh, to have the honour of uh, being the right worshipful master of, of my mother lodge. So for those that are familiar with the area, we're, we're fairly near to Glasgow. We're actually only about an hour away from, from Glasgow. As myself, I'm an artist, I'm a firefighter and I'm an ex-serviceman. And as I say, I returned to the the island after seven years uh, seven years ago now, after being uh, away for about uh, a decade. Now, despite being an analyst for many years and loving nothing more than a cup of coffee in a database full of numbers, which is tends to be my day job, I am a creative at heart. And uh, even before I picked up a pencil again to start drawing, I'm, I've always been fascinated by the arts, be it music, be it uh, traditional visual art. Uh, and even performance art. These are some of my my drawings. Uh, so this gives you an idea of, of where I'm coming from um, as a as a, somebody that's interested in art. I started drawing again two years ago. Uh, I draw in pencil, and each one of these has been completed just within the, the last two years. Uh, the one top left is actually the most famous landmark on our tiny little island. It's called the Crocodile Rock. And the story goes that a drunk man came out of the pub one evening, saw a rock and decided it looked like a crocodile. So he went and got a couple of paints of a couple of pots of paint and decided to paint it. Uh, and it's been like that for the last hundred years. So that's the, the crocodile rock. Naturally, being an artist myself, I sort of gravitated towards the art of Freemasonry. And when we talk about the art of Freemasonry, there's so many different subsections of that. But the one area that interests me pro probably the most is tracing boards. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. Now, for anyone that knows me and has maybe seen this presentation in one shape or form before, you'll know that I'm starting to develop a slight obsession with tracing boards. Um, and I, I find them fascinating. And I think that there's something that can be applied to our daily lives as Freemasons. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that just at, at the end of the presentation. I'm very open to questions. Um, I, I just ask if we could maybe keep them till the end, um, just for the sake of the, the flow of the presentation. Um, but I'm, I'm more than happy to talk about all sorts of, of various bits about Freemasonry. Um, naturally, this is a public uh, presentation. And I appreciate that uh, Brother Christian, I think it was, um, as an entered apprentice, may not understand some of the, the the more advanced elements. So if I don't answer a certain thing or I can't answer at a certain point, um, then I, I will say that. Please don't be offended. Um, I'm sure you all understand the, the reasons, brethren. And um, yeah, let's let's carry on. So the, there are three main tracing boards in uh, craft Freemasonry, which is what we're going to focus on today. And there are countless variations of each of these designs. Uh, which represent the, the three degrees within craft Freemasonry. I appreciate that in some jurisdictions this will vary. Um, and when I talk about uh, craft Freemasonry, it may also vary in your uh, jurisdiction. Everything that I'm talking about today is from my point of view as a, a Scottish Freemason. Um, and there won't be any sort of secrets or anything put forward in this presentation I will be following the, the, the rules and the sort of regulations of, of the, the, the Grand Lodge of Scotland. If that does vary in your jurisdiction, um, I do apologise. And as, as before, I hope you, you won't take offence um, from, from anything I say in that respect. So what is a Masonic tracing board? A Masonic tracing board is probably most easily described as a PowerPoint presentation a bit like I'm giving at the moment. It's a graphical representation of the various lessons and secrets of Freemasonry. But what's particularly interesting about a Masonic tracing board, and I know this again doesn't happen in all jurisdictions, they can be displayed publicly without giving anything away. To the, to the lay person, to the, a member of the public, they're just a nice piece of art with lots of symbols in them, but it doesn't actually mean anything unless you understand the lessons, uh, the, the morality, and the, the secrets behind them. This, what's on the screen at the moment is a, a, a sort of small sample of some of the tracing boards that we might expect to see today. 
And we're going to go into these in a little bit more detail as we go through. And we're also going to discuss the history of how these developed. So trestle board or tracing board, we're getting right into the, the very heart of it here. Uh, this question is probably as old as tracing boards themselves. And I should begin that although what I'm going to say here is my own personal opinion, for every five Masons that agree with me, there's probably seven other Masons that disagree with me. And hopefully by the end of this, you'll be able to form your own opinion on trestle board versus tracing board. Today, it seems to be a provincial or a, a jurisdictional preference, whether you refer to it as a trestle board or a tracing board. And it tends to be a term, that they tend to be terms that are used interchangeably, but mean essentially the same thing. I don't believe that this was always the case, however. I believe that the trestle board is something actually a tracing board would have been placed upon. And we're going to go in, I'm going to go into a bit more detail on these specific terms. Um, However, I think in older times, the trestle board and the tracing board would have been two completely different items as to what they are today. The trestle or the trestle, as it would be sometimes referred to, likely comes from either Old Scots or more likely uh, Old French. And it means, means a beam or a support. And if we think about today, a trestle table with the folding legs, I, I'm assuming you have these in... in uh, various countries and jurisdictions around the world, then if you think about the legs folding under the table, it gives you an idea of what we're talking about when we talk about a trestle. In the context of Freemasonry, it's a term that predates that of tracing board by at least 40 years. And I say at least 40 years because that's when we start to see the written documentation about it. The chances are, as a term, it probably existed long before that. If we look at the, the frontispiece um, from the Anderson's Constitution from the, the 1784 edition, which is the image on the left-hand side of the screen here, this is actually a good example of what a trestle board would be. So this is a, a board that's been laid in the centre of the lodge on which there has been um, various uh, items with symbolic meaning that have been placed on top of it. And underneath it, we can see two stands, probably in the form of a table, but without a top on it. And these are trestles that uh, we would refer to in a modern sense. So this is probably a trestle board in the, the, the more um, tra traditional sense. This setup was done a lot at the sort of dedication of, or the rededication of a lodge or the, um, the constituting of a lodge um, in order to lay out the various symbols. And, Brethren would stand around this, and we've got some examples later on, would stand around this and be taught various aspects of Freemasonry. If we look at the 1820 example of a tracing board, this is what we would expect to see probably in a lodge today. This is actually one of the early designs from Brother John Harris, who we'll talk about later. And we can actually see here between the Ionic and the Corinthian pillar, so that's the, the pillar in the middle and the pillar on the right-hand side, that there is a tracing board within the tracing board. Now, a tracing board would traditionally be used for by a, a stonemason to draw out the plans of the work that lies ahead. So we have a situation here where we have a tracing board, which represents the lodge um, and the various aspects of the lodge and the various lessons of the lodge. And right in the very middle of it, the white square surrounded by the, the brown board is a tracing board. So it's a, a, a tracing board within a tracing board. And you can see how things start to get confusing because one is for the master to lay his plans on. The other one represents the lodge. And I do another presentation called the form of the lodge, um, which goes into this in a little bit more detail um, and why we call what we call a tracing board today a tracing board. I usually at this point say, um, are you confused? Welcome to Masonic history, because this is quite common when you start to look at the various aspects of, of Freemasonry, particularly historically. Lots of terms get used for different things. They mean different things to different people. And um, tracing boards are, are one of the, the prime examples. Now, on the 1755 image on the right-hand side, 
you can actually see, and it, it may be a bit difficult, I do apologise, but on the, I don't know if you can see my cursor, um, but on the right-hand side here, we actually have the mason um, drawing on a trestle, a trestle board with a we tracing don't, we board. We don't see your cursor. Right. Okay. Um, my apologies. I usually use my iPad to be able to do this, but I'm, I'm using the computer today. Um, on the right-hand side, uh, just near the very edge of the, 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 the image, you will see that the, the master is drawing on a board. And it's a, a sort of easel type setup. And there are legs coming from the back of the, the drawing board. And that's a trestle. Okay. So there we have, in the, the traditional sense, the tracing board sitting upon the trestle. Um, and that's the, the most common interpretation of the difference between trestle and tracing board. Now, today, um, as I say, you will probably come to your own conclusions about this. However, for, for the purposes of the presentation, I'm going to use the term tracing board quite loosely, unless I say otherwise um, with regards to, to what it actually means. So where did it all begin and how did it develop? Now, like most things in Freemasonry, the origins belong to a time when record keeping and the thoughts towards archiving led a little bit to be desired. Leaving us today in 2021, making what we like to think are educated guesses. Now, to understand the development of a tracing board, we need to go back to the early 18th century, where Freemasonry was very different from what we would recognise in most jurisdictions around the world today. The way things were done, the phrases that were used, their meanings, and even the term the lodge, for example, was very different. That term, the lodge, today to most members of the, the craft, would probably mean that it was the lodge building that meetings were held in, or it was the Masonic meetings themselves. It can mean a variety of different things. It's a bit like the word church in that respect. The church can be the building, it can be the people in the building, it can be the organisation that represents that organisation. So it's, it's a multi-use word. However, in the early 1700s, it was far more metaphorical and symbolic in nature. It was common for lodges at this, term, this time to meet up in taverns, opposed to any sort of purpose-built residence, and meetings would be held in a shared space with non-members using it before and after Masonic meetings. Carpets at this time were completely unheard of, and the form of the lodge, which we will speak about in a little bit uh, just shortly, would be drawn onto the floor of the, the floorboards of the tavern um, using either chalk or charcoal. And the suggestion being that this has evolved from a time where Masonic meetings would be held outside and uh, in the, the, the sort of the highest hills and the, the lowest valleys, particularly in Scotland, we have minutes that actually refer to outside meetings. And the form of the lodge at that time would be drawn in the dirt. And then the entered apprentice would uh, be stood at the, the drawing on the, the floor and they would be educated and taught the, the various lessons of Freemasonry. Very similar to the way we would do it today with a tracing board, if that's done in your particular lodge. Now, this was most regularly drawn by the tiler, who would be paid a tiler's fee for doing this throughout the 18th century. And even into the early 19th century, we see minutes and financial entries that, that show this, particularly in Scotland and England. The form of the lodge, as I say, would be drawn on the floor, which symbols would be then either drawn within that or later placed for the guidance and, and instruction of the brethren who gathered around it, um, particularly the new, newly made entered apprentice. So you can start to see the similarities here between what was happening in the 18th century and 19th century and what might happen today in a lodge where um, an, an instructor or a conductor would stand in front of a tracing board and educate brethren on the symbolism within that tracing board. Now, the earliest reference that we have to this isn't a minute or a tracing board or anything like that at all, actually. It's a piece of art that was created in 1723. And this is one that I recently looked at in my, my own newsletter, which I'll, I'll, um, I'll go into in a little, 
a little while, and it's by an artist uh, called William Hogarth. Now, Hogarth would later become a Freemason. However, at the time of creating this particular piece, uh, which is called The Mystery of Masonry, brought to light by Ye Gormajons, he wasn't a Mason. And despite, uh, despite the fact that when you look closely at this piece of art, he knew quite a lot about his subject matter. It's a satirical piece, um, and it makes light of some of the events and the relationships that surrounded Freemasonry and an anti-Masonic group called the Gormajons around, in, around the, the time of the formation of the First Grand Lodge in England. What's interesting about this, particularly for us today, is that in the middle, hanging from the ladder, um, so you can see that we have the, the, the donkey in the middle with a ladder going across it, um, the ladder um, representing Jacob's ladder. Um, sitting on top of that ladder, we actually have Desigoulier, who was one of the, the first Grand Master Masons of the United Grand Lodge of England. And with his head through the ladder, that's actually James Anderson who wrote the first constitutions. Um, and what's happening there is James Anderson is actually supposed to be kissing the, back, the bare backside of Desigoulier. So you can see where the, the satirical piece of it comes in. But what's most interesting is that hanging from that ladder, we have a bucket with a mop, a square and a mallet. Now, the square and the mallet are obviously uh, tools, working tools of the, the mason. And the, the joke here is that the mop and the bucket are also tools of the mason. And what they're, they're suggesting here um, is that because you would draw the form of the lodge on the floor in chalk or charcoal, the lesson to the entered apprentice at the end of it was to use the mop and the bucket to clean the floor so that the secrets of Freemasonry would be closely guarded and not revealed to anyone outside of the, the craft. Now, by this point, this was almost certain not a new custom. It had been around for some time to the extent that people outside of Freemasonry were aware of it, such as Hogarth. In 1725, we get to see an example of this from a manuscript called the Karmic Manuscript. I apologise, 1727. I've got my dates wrong. Um, this is from a, a catechism. Um, and... The Karmic Manuscript, we, we don't know an awful lot about it. We certainly don't know about the, the individual that it's named after. Um, however, some of the research that has been done on it uh, goes into people that owned it since then. And it is a very, very old document. It's probably been copied from a much older document as well, because when you look at the way it's written, it, it sort of almost reads as though it's been copied from another document. The, there is a lot of text in it, but this image is towards the end of the text as a sort of annex. And the title of it is, This Figure Represents the Lodge. And the suggestion being that this would actually be what was drawn on the floor. Okay, now there's lots going on in this particular image, which we're, we're going to quickly talk about. But this would be the form of the lodge. Now, what's unusual about this is that uh, in the Karmic manuscript, it's drawn as a triangular shape. It's not unique. I have some other examples. I will show this. But the examples elsewhere are not as clear as what has been drawn here on the page. There's some evidence to support the triangular shape in uh, Europe. The Sloan manuscript talks about it. And I've also got an example in Scotland um, in a very, very famous painting, which we'll maybe have time to look at shortly. And indeed, some lodges in Scotland still place the master and the two wardens in a triangular shape within the lodge, um, as opposed to um, the, the more traditional or the, sorry, the more modern um, way that you would expect to see a, a, a Freemason's lodge set up. Now, the, the overall design of this is based on an old level. Um, an old Mason's level would be triangular shaped like this. The plumb line is hanging down from the middle, uh, from the centre, at the, the top point, right the way down to the, the bottom. And at the end of the plumb line, we have a disc. Now, naturally, a plumb line needs some sort of weight. So I believe the reason for the disc being at the bottom is to act as that weight. This could also represent the blazing star surrounded by the points of the compass, uh, which it's very difficult to see there, but it is 
orientated the same way you would expect to see a lodge today, with east being at the top, south, west and north on the, the left hand side. Below this and at the bottom of the level, we have two rows of mosaic pavement, the, the checkered board pattern. Now, we've been doing a wee bit of research into this, or I've been doing a wee bit of research into this, because you, the, you'll notice that the, the pattern changes halfway through. Now, I'm yet to find a good ex explanation as to why this happens, and it's my own belief that this has probably been a mistake by Brother Karmic. Um, however, what calls that into question is that there's actually 15 squares there, which seems very deliberate, as we'll go into in a little bit, if you remember the number 15 and why it's so important. Um, it seems unusual that he would make such a glaring mistake with the, the actual pattern changing in that way, um, whilst still remembering to put in the 15 squares. Um, so that's quite interesting. I would love to know if anyone has ever come up with an a, a, a explanation as to why that might be the case. Um, the only explanation that's really been given to me on this is the possibility of starting out of order and coming into order um, as you progress through Freemasonry. Um, whilst it's a nice suggestion, I haven't ever found any sort of historical evidence to, to back up that thinking. Um, Sticking with the, the mosaic pavement, you'll see that there's two rows of this. This probably comes from a time that predates the third degree, um, the, the, the Master Mason's degree. Um, it was very common for there to, to be two degrees around this time, and that's most likely why there are, there are two rows. It's also worth pointing out at this point that the term master, which we can see on the right-hand side of the triangle, was in, was in use long before the, introdu the introduction of the Master Mason's degree. And it was actually used as a way of identifying stone masons that had employees or apprentices that worked with them rather than as a separate degree. And we see this as far back as the 16th century as William Shaw, who's the, the Master of Works to King James VI of Scotland when he wrote his first and second Shaw statutes. And if you've never looked into William Shaw, then please contact me after this. I'll be more than happy to send you a copy of my book, uh, which talks about William Shaw and his influence back in 1598 and 1599 on Freemasonry as it is today. Now, on the three sides of the level, towards the bottom, we see the positioning of the brethren. We have the fellow craft on the left, the masters on the right, and the entered apprentice at the foot of the triangle. The warden, Again, this is a term that was used uh, in early Scotland and in some places is still used today as a way of referring to what most lodges would call the Right Worshipful Master. Um, in my mother lodge, we have the Right Worshipful Master and we have the Senior and the Junior Wardens. Um, but at this time, the Warden was actually the Master of the Lodge. And again, if we look into a lot of the historical documents in Scotland, we, we see evidence of that. Within the shape, we find various tools, various working tools. We see the square, the compasses, the plum rule, uh, the mallet, the trowel, and two symbols at the very top, which actually represent candles. Um, so the, the three bars across are the candlestick with the candle and the flame at the top of it. Some people have suggested that this could be a skirt, which I know is not something that's used an awful lot um, in some jurisdictions but that is a working tool that we have here in Scotland. Um, but having done some research into that, it's actually not a skirt, it's a candle. And for those that don't know what a skirt is, it's a, 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 a tool which you can pull a cord or a line from. You can chalk that line and then you can use it to mark out the ground um, for the, the foundations of a, a building or intended structure. Finally, around the, the two vertical edges of the, the triangles, uh, the triangle, sorry, we see from right to left the numbers one through 15. Now, 15 is being is a symbolic number for the name of God in Hebrew. Um, I do apologize, my Hebrew is not probably what it should be as a Scotsman. Um, I, I believe it's pronounced Yod He. And the best guess here is that, that those numbers actually represent the positioning of brethren as they would stand around that particular diagram on the floor. Now, if we think that this has been drawn in chalk or charcoal, 
um, and we think to some of the customs that we have today. We square the lodge. We don't stand, um, we, we don't walk across the lodge. That would be very important at this time because if you, were, if you didn't square the drawing or you didn't um, avoid stepping on the drawing, then you would, un, you would erase all of the work that the tiler did in order, to, um, in order for the education. So I, it's my belief, again, that the, the concept of going around the outer perimeter of the lodge probably dates from a time when it was actually drawn on the floor or in the dirt so that you wouldn't erase the, um, the, the lessons for that day. Unknown to Brother Carmack, he's unintentionally created the first, one of the first known examples of a tracing board here. It's been put into a manuscript, into his own personal copy for the purpose of guidance, instruction and memorising what he has to do as a Freemason. Um, that is the very definition of a tracing board. So although it wasn't what he was trying to do, it's what he actually did. This is some examples of other triangular shapes. These are from minutes that were uh, from Lodge Vienna and uh, Lodge, Lodge Friedrich. And although this wouldn't be drawn on the floor, it is a sort of symbol, sim, um, symbolical representation of the lodge. And although it might be quite difficult to see here, the brethren are actually represented by the, the, the jewels of their office at various points in the um, in, in the, the diagram. These diagrams are actually taken from um, the AQA, uh, AQC books um, from the, the, the research lodge here in Britain. And uh, if you're, you're looking for, for more information on it, I'm also happy to send this presentation to anyone that wishes it. Um, just put your email in the chat. I'll be more than happy to send it through to you so you can have a, a better look at these things. There are other examples of the form of the lodge, um, one of which actually predates the Karmic manuscript. That's the one on the left here. This is from a catechism known as a dialogue with Philip and Simon. It's from 1725. What it actually says, it shows one diagram at the top with the caption, this is the form of the old lodges. And we can see that it's actually in a sort of um, a cross cruciform type shape. And then at the bottom, we have an oblong square, something we'd be more familiar with today. And this is actually the lodge um, after the reformation of Desagulier, uh, who we mentioned earlier on was, was sitting on the donkey in the, in the piece of art that I showed. As we start to progress in the 1760s, we see a form of the lodge, which is a lot similar to what we would expect to see today. It's rectangular in shape, sometimes referred to as um, a parallelopipedron, which is the most crazy word I've ever heard. Um, it just basically means an oblong square, a rectangle. Um, and we've got two different examples here. The, the example in the middle um, is for the ancient. Um, so that's the, 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 the sort of the ancient side of, of masonry. And we can see there it only has the two steps, the apprentice and the craft step. And the example on the right um, we actually have three steps, and that was actually from the moderns, because around this time, you had both ancient Freemasonry and modern Freemasonry, because it predates the amalgamation of the, the Grand Lodges. Although these are not as detailed as the, the previous examples, the idea would still be that these would be drawn on the floor, and that the working tools or symbols representing the working tools would actually be laid out or drawn within them. Now, although these are not exactly tracing boards and not uh, directly associated to what we've just been looking at, at the time that these books and exposures were being written, and when I say exposure, there's a, a, a belief that an exposure means it was somebody that was giving away the secrets of Freemasonry. And whilst, yes, there were books that did that, some of the exposures were actually written by Freemasons for other Freemasons. And it was used as a sort of ritual book, as you would expect to get in a lodge today. Um, so when we use the term exposure, it doesn't always mean um, that they were giving away the secrets of Freemasonry. And indeed, a lot of the people that wrote the books were Freemasons. And these books, um, from which some of the diagrams that we've already looked at were in, 
would always have a diagram on the front page. It was called a frontispiece. And the point of this was just to make it look nice when they opened the book. It was that first impression of the, the book to the reader. Now, the example on the left from Langley's Builder, The Builder's Jewel in 1741, that actually becomes a form of tracing board in later years. And I've got a good example of that um, to look at, um, although it's not a tracing board at this time. Now, if you look on the left-hand side between the, the left-hand pillar and the middle pillar, you'll see that there's a hill. And at the very top of that hill, there is a number. And I know it's quite difficult to see, but it's the number 15. Um, and it's the highest point of the land closest to the heavens. And it's number 15, which, as we said before, represents the um, symbolically represents God. We have the working tools put on some of the pillars. Uh, we have uh, right on the very central piece, we uh, central pillar, my apologies, we have what could represent a tracing board. We can see the mosaic, um, the mosaic floor, and we can see the, the, the points of the compass as well. What's interesting about this, however, is the east is at the bottom as opposed to at the top. The two examples on the right-hand side, um, the, the one in the middle uh, from the 1762 exposure, um, that was uh, actually turned into a lot of, of various uh, jewellery. At, at certain points, you had pendants, which you could be turned round, and it would have an, an example of that on it. And the example on the right-hand side, uh, which is a French exposure, um, that's actually a tracing board design that's very common throughout Europe, and we've got some more examples of that coming. Now, there's no set progression for um, the, the development of tracing boards through this. However, if I was to, to, to say how it would go naturally, it would probably be drawing on the floor. Then they realised that not all tilers can draw or have art artistic uh, merit to their name. So they wanted a, an easier way to do this. So they would come up with a thing called a floor cloth, which I'll speak about just now. And then after that, um, they would try to go on to the, the, the tracing boards, um, which will be coming very, very soon. The dates do jump around a little bit for this. Um, I do have a copy of a timeline, which I'll be happy to, to share as well. The earliest example of, of a floor cloth um, is actually from a, a book called The Ceremonies of Religion and Custom from 1733. And this is where we can see French masons conducting a degree of some form um, surrounding what is clearly some sort of cloth that has been placed on the floor. Now, this is actually th some 30 years before two of the exposures we were just looking at where they were still drawing things on the floor. So as you can see, the timeline isn't as, as straight as, as we would hope. This same year, the Old King's Arms Lodge in nine, uh, number 28, uh, in their minutes, they actually minuted the purchase of a canvas for the proper delineation, as well as the purchase of a drawing board and T, they call it, for the use of the master and his lodge. And it was just the letter T. Um, so it's unclear whether that T stands for trestle or T square. Um, but if it's a drawing board they're talking about, then the chances are it would be um, either one of those two things. But what's interesting about this is that they're, they're asking for a canvas for proper delineation, i.e. a floor cloth, and they're also looking for a drawing board with a T. Um, so they're not using the term tracing board, um, which I think is, again, another example of the, the separation between the two, the two things. At the minute reads, the acting master represented that whereas the instu institution of new brethren was attended with more than ordinary and perhaps unnecessary trouble. It was therefore moved that a proper delineation should be made on canvas and deposited in the repository ready for those occasions. So what are they doing? They're simply taking the form of the lodge that they would have been drawing on the floor. They're putting it on canvas. They can take it out when they need it. They can put it away in storage afterwards. It allows it to be more artistic and it speeds up the whole process. In 1736, a floor cloth representing the several forms of the Mason's Lodges is presented to the Theatre Tavern uh, Lodge in England. And that's starting to tell us that there wasn't just one example of this, but indeed there were several different floor cloths 
that would be used for different purposes. We see this again visually in the, the order of French Masons, and you'll forgive me if I don't uh, subject you to my terrible French accent um, by trying to, to pronounce its proper title. This was from 1745, and we can see that there's at least two different floor cloths uh, with diagrams that have been provided on how these should be laid out. Now, what's particularly interesting about these examples is that there's several examples of these types of cloths being forbidden. This publication itself actually states the lodge proper, i.e. the figures drawn on the floor on reception days, must be quite literally craned and must not be painted on a cloth, which is kept specially for those days. At the same time as putting loads of diagrams and examples in the book showing exactly cloths being placed on the floor. In 1759, uh, in, the uh, in a, one of the Scottish lodges in Edinburgh, um, they received a report that a floor cloth was being displayed in a painter's window. And it reads, it having been represented that a painted cloth containing the flooring of a master's lodge was hanging publicly exposed in a painter's shop. And they, considering that the same might be pernicious consequences to masonry, ordered that it be sent for and in regard to the use of such painted floorings, was expressly forbid, instructed Lodge St Andrews to whom it belonged, not in future to use such floors. And actually, in Freemasonry worldwide, that kind of thing has never been rescinded. Um, so officially speaking, we still shouldn't be using tracing boards, despite the fact that Grand Lodges and, and Lodges all over, around, all over the world use tracing boards and... Um, have specific designs and things set up for them. This is a very small selection of some of the floor cloths that, um, some of the oldest floor cloths that we um, we see. And the one on the left is from County Armagh in, in Ireland. Um, what's interesting about this one is that the moon is on the left and the sun is on the right. And quite commonly um, in tracing boards, you will see it the other way around. And I've never found an example as to why sometimes they're back to front. At first, I thought it was maybe something to do with the uh, a fact with it being a facsimile copy. But if that was the case, then the letter G and some of the other lettering around the, the tracing board or the floor cloth, sorry, uh, would be back to front as well. Um, so it's quite a deliberate thing that's been done there. Um, but I don't know why. Um, the my apologies. The example on the far right-hand side is an interesting one because this is from a lodge in Vienna. This is very similar to what I said the French or the, the European uh, tracing boards would look like. And what's particularly interesting about this one is where all other floor cloths tend to be on a material such as canvas, this one's actually on leather. It's a, a leather in, uh, sort of insert, I'm told, and what's even more interesting about it is it has the rope with the infinity knot. Now, that's the, the rope there at the top of the, the diagram is supposed to represent brotherly love and the, the, the binding of brethren together um, in brotherly love. It's very common on European tracing boards, and it usually replaces the, um, the, the border, um, the, the tessellated border around, um, around the, the tracing board or the floor cloth. But here on this example from the, the Lodge in Vienna, we actually have both. Very, very quickly, um, tassels are quite a common topic uh, that get discussed a lot in Facebook groups and elsewhere. In modern day tracing boards, we, send, we tend to see four tassels in the, the extreme corners of the, the boards. These represent the, the four, um, the four perfect points of interest, uh, of entrance. So that's guttural, pectoral, manual, and pedal, which in turn then allude to the four cardinal virtues of temperance, fortitude, prudence, and justice. But this is actually a later addition to Freemasonry, um, sort of around the, the early 19th century, as they started to introduce tracing boards as we would know them today. Um, prior to that, it was more common to see the tassels on the end of the rope, which we can see several examples of there in the early, the early diagrams. 
with uh, what I believe, and it's been suggested to me, that this actually comes from operative masonry, where a, an operative stonemason would dangle a plumb, a line from the corner of the room with a tassel at the bottom uh, to prove that the, the walls and that the corners were um, correctly aligned uh, on a building. And if you look at each of these diagrams, you can see that the tassels actually hang from the corner of the board. And I think that's uh, possibly some sort of symbolic representation of that. However, I'm, I'm yet to find any uh, clear evidence that, that supports that. So getting on to tracing boards themselves, and I am skipping over quite a lot of things here just for the, the sake of time. So if you do have any questions, please feel free to, um, to, to sort of pull me back on that after we're finished. The early tracing board designers that you would, ex um, you would expect to, to see start to come around about the early 18th century and into the, the, the early 19th. Names such as Brothers John Brown, Jacobs, John Cole, Josiah Bowring, Arthur Sisselton are all very, very similar. Um, sorry, are all very, very common for the early designs. These primarily fo followed what became known as the chart pattern, a bit like a, a chart for a C chart, if you like. Um, very simple in its design. They were minimalistic and flat. There wasn't a lot of depth from an artistic point of view. Not dissimilar to the floor cloths that we looked at previously. Now, these would have been an evolution of the floor cloths so that instead of the brethren sitting, uh, sorry, standing around the floor, these could now be put on a screen or they could be put on the wall as a piece of artwork. And it meant that brethren weren't having to sort of constantly look at the floor. At this time, the pillars, we, we start to see, see three pillars. Um, although there were some examples of having three pillars before, it was very commonly two. And the pillars start to take on um, different heights. And the example on the left is actually the first example that we see of this from Brother John Brown. This is actually in accordance with the proper architectural specifications. So the Doric pillar on the left is seven diameters high. The Ionic pillar is eight diameters high. And the Corinthian pillar is nine di uh, diameters high. And these represent wisdom, strength, and beauty, which was the, the practice at that time. These tracing boards were being created in order to visualize the lectures that were being produced and published around this time. And they were being presented in lodges, particularly around England, by Brother John Brown himself, who spent a lot of money and a lot of his own time traveling around the country in an attempt to standardize the craft um, and the ritual of the craft. The, the colour version, which is in the, the second from the right, that's an, actually a, a, an evolution of the frontispiece from Langley's The Builder's Jewel, which we looked at earlier on. And this is actually from St Andrew's Lodge in New York from 1800. Now, the first of these artists to make a name for himself was Brother John Brown. And the, the examples that are shown here are from the second edition of his book, The Master's Key, with the diagram here on the left being from the first edition. So you can see he was starting to get a little bit um, more organised, a little bit more artistic in what he was doing. In Brown's first degree board, which is the, the one on the left-hand side, um, we can actually see that not only are there the three pillars, which have been previously described, um, but these are also associated with the three principal characters or the three principal personalities of Freemasonry. Also, what's interesting is the checkered, uh, checkered floor. Again, we see a slightly different type of pattern here. Um, the the, the coloured squares actually overline, uh, overlap each other, which is, is quite unusual. The tracing board uh, or the, um, the drawing board at the top left, just under the sun. When he drew this previously, it was just a white triangle, whereas we now actually have the, um, the problem of Euclid and the, the letter T to represent a tracing board. So once again, an example of a tracing board within a tracing board. John Brown was always quite uh, was also quite interesting because he's one of the few artists that actually kept the four tassels on all three of his tracing boards. Normally, you would only see that on the first degree board. The example on the extreme right from the third degree, um, we actually have here 
um, the, the sort of three groups, uh, two with five in it and one with four in it, and these are actually bees. Now, the, the bee and the, the hive has a lot of symbolic meaning in Freemasonry, uh, particularly in America, I'm led to believe. And this actually, although there's no hive here, um, it's likely that the, the groups of five bees represent the, the, the three lodges of five fellow craft, um, with one of the bees being represented by an actual individual at the top of the, in the second pane. And in the bottom right, we also have a monogram, which represents, again, the three principal personalities in Freemasonry. Brother John Cole was a contemporary of Brown who again followed the chart pattern. And you can easily see the, the similarities in the designs here. A lot of the same uh, symbols, a lot of the same items are being contained within these. What's interesting about uh, Cole's version is, again, he has a different mosaic floor. Um, in the first degree, it's a, a, a diamond shaped. Um, and also we have the uh, blazing star hidden behind the iconic pillar, uh, sorry, the ionic pillar in the middle, um, which is quite unusual. What I particularly like about the first degree here is that the sun is actually rising from behind the clouds, which is quite an unusual, an unusual thing to see. Now, these are very, very early examples, and they were quite crude in the way that they were drawn. Brother Josiah Bowring was a portrait artist, and he put this to good use with his tracing board designs. Um, this is actually a mixed set from, from various, various times that were painted between 1810 and 1820. And you can see that Bowring moves away from that flat, minimalistic uh, chart pattern for his first degree, and he actually starts to add a bit of depth to the image. We also see for the first time anywhere in any art to do with Freemasonry, um, the, the virtues of faith, hope and charity being represented by female figures as opposed to the letters F, H and C, which was very common at that time. Finally, the key, which um, is very difficult to spot in this, and I do apologise, but if you look at the very bottom of the, the, the tracing board on the left-hand side, and on the white square, you'll see that there's a key lying on the floor. Um, this is actually corrected in later versions of his tracing boards, where it then hangs from the thread of life from Jacob's Ladder, as per the emulation lecture. And that's a, a, a symbol and a, a, a lesson that has remained in Freemasonry from that time ever since. One thing about Bowring was uh, he definitely had a, an interesting way of portraying the tracing board of the third degree. And although it's not completely unique, the open coffin is definitely a signature of this artist. Um, and we don't see a lot of it going forward. What I particularly like about this uh, tracing board on the right-hand side is that he actually has a, a small depiction of the, the cave with the three ruffians um, within it. Again, we, we don't see that a lot. Now, each one of these three design of these designers would be overshadowed by an artist who was instrumental in the design of tracing boards as we would now know them today, and that was Brother John Harris. And you probably recognise these tracing boards from your own lodges because these are the, the sort of the standard, the unofficial standard for a tracing board. His early example in 1820 on the left is a clear progression of the chart pattern with elements from some of the the more artistic style of bowring as it started to develop. But he quickly developed this himself into even an even more artistic style. And in 1825, Harris produced with permission a special set of painted miniatures um, of each of the three degrees for his, his Royal Highness the Duke of Sussex, who was a Grand Master of the United Grand Lodge of England. And these were then mass produced, or as mass produced as it could be in those days, um, for brethren to have in a trifold binder, which is hopefully you can sort of make that out from the diagram there. What's particularly interesting is the level of detail that are in these tracing boards. The, these were probably no bigger than A5, um, if we were to talk in modern paper terms. So they were very small, and yet the level of detail that he hand-painted onto these was absolutely spectacular. In the early examples of the Harris tracing boards in the second, de second degree, which you can see in the middle here, um, the two great pillars are flanking the staircase 
of uh, to the middle chamber. This was actually deemed to be a mistake, and it was later fixed in other examples by splitting the board into two separate parts, um, showing the south porchway in one and the winding staircase in another, in accordance with the, the lectures at that time. In 1945, the Emula Emulation Lodge of Improvement launched a competition for an improvement in tracing boards, and this was actually won by Brother John Harris, and the boards that he produced are very similar to the ones that you see on the screen just now, and indeed very similar to those that you would see around the world today, and in particular in England. This is a nice display of the third degree tracing boards um, that were designed by all by Brother John Harris going through the, the various years. We can see on the left in 1825, he starts very flat. There's no depth, there's no shadow, nothing like that. The, some of the design elements remain consistent throughout, but by the time we get to 1845, it's much more realistic looking. Now, we talk about today a Harris board, and that refers to a style or a design, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it was actually designed or done by John Harris himself. Um, the 1850 is one of my favourite all-time tracing boards, um, simply because it shows all the same things, but it's a very different way to portray it with the, the grave as opposed to the, the coffin. What's interesting about this is, and my Hebrew, as I said before, is not up to the, the standard it possibly should be. The text that's shown in Hebrew on the scrolls um, is actually incorrect. Um, he's made an error when he's been copying the, the Hebrew for, for, the, um, for the, the scrolls. And it's not until 1850 on the example on the, the, the headstone there that it's actually corrected. Um, I, I'm un, unclear what the actual error is, um, however, um, I've been told by brethren that know a lot more about me that um, John Harris made quite a few errors uh, when he was copying his Hebrew. Slightly more modern, 1937, these were designed by Lady Frida Harris um, as part of her studies into the teachings of Jacob Steiner and Goeth on projective synthetic geometry. Now, I'd love to be able to tell you a little bit more about projective synthetic geometry. Um, however, I don't know an awful lot about it other than it is to do with the convergence and the running of parallel lines. And I think if you look at the, the example on the left-hand side of the first degree board, it, it, it's a very good example of the, the study of, of projective synthetic geometry, which I just like saying because it makes me sound really, really intelligent. Um, the example in the middle, um, we can actually see the, the golden ratio at play here. Um, and these all have symbolic meaning. She actually designed an awful lot of tarot cards as well, which are very similar to this. I think this is a good example, however, of the type of, or the, the different things that can be achieved with the same symbology um, and the same symbolism, um, sorry. Um, but done in a slightly different artistic manner. These are some more modern examples. Um, the example on the, the extreme left is from the Grand Lodge of Scotland. You can actually buy that from the Grand Lodge of Scotland website. Um, it's very simple. Um, it's almost like a colouring book more than anything else. Um, the example second from the right um, is from, it's, it's a modern artist that has done this for uh, lodges in Hungary. And I think this is a, a great example of what can be achieved with a, um, a, a sort of more modern artistic, um, artistic brain. And it, it's very out there in terms of the, the more traditional designs, but you can still see each of the, the different symbols and each of the different bits that are represented by a tracing board. Um, the third image, that's uh, a printed version of the more modern representations of the European style of tracing board. And on the right-hand side, Brother Gregory B. Stewart um, in 2006 did a, a sort of photorealism uh, example. And you can actually see, uh, I believe he's done uh, one for each degree, and he's used Photoshop to um, sort of mix the, the, the various aspects of the tracing board into um, a sort of more modern piece of art. Now, although tracing boards are not a big part of ritual today and in many countries and jurisdictions, 
they are still being created and they are still being displayed in lodges. For example, my mother lodge, Lodge Kelburn, we don't actually teach uh, or have any part of ritual that uh, revolves around a tracing board, but we still display all three tracing boards on the walls of the lodge. And after the meeting, you will quite commonly see the entered apprentice um, standing with one of the master masons talking about the tracing board and what some of the bits represent, albeit it's not part of the, the, the ritual itself now. Um, what I would like to say is that although tracing boards are fun and interesting to look at from an artistic point of view, especially if you're, you're into it as, as heavily as I am, we shouldn't forget that they actually have a real purpose. And as I mentioned at the start of the presentation, it's to lay out the plans for the work that lays ahead. And I think as Freemasons, we should each have our own personal tracing board to help us plan for the work that lies ahead. This may be as simple as a to-do list. It may be as complex as a business plan or even as artistic as some of the ones that we've looked at today. But I think as a Freemason, if we plan and look ahead at the work that we have, um, we will be more productive and we will achieve more of what we are hoping to. Um, so I would like to finish today, brethren, um, by showing you an example of, of a tracing board that I am currently working on. Um, this is one of my drawings and I, I hope it will be finished in the, the near future. It has updated a little bit since that picture was taken. And I would like to ask you, brethren, to take some time today after this presentation to consider what plans are on your tracing board. And thank you again, Brother Chris, for inviting me here today. And thank you, brethren, for coming and um, your attention. It's very much appreciated. Thank you very much, uh, Brother Scott. That was, uh, that was very, very nice. I really enjoyed that. Um, I had a couple of questions if I could, and then we'll open up to the floor. Since I'm in charge, I could do that. Um, <laughs> If you could bring up the uh, first of all, I want to put this out there and looking at some of the earlier, some of the more artistic ones. Imagine if Salvador Dali was a mason and what kind of tracing board he would yeah. make for us. <laughs> that would because some of those reminded me a bit of him, the, the ones with the perspective. If you go back to the ceremonies of religion and custom, that was the French one where they're pointing at the floor. Mm hmm. Yep. So I have a quick question. I followed most of the symbolism. Um, do we know what are the little shapes on that board? Is that these are tear yeah? These are, these are teardrops. Um, so I, I don't I don't want to go into too much of the um, the, the the ritual side of obviously the, the degree that's been presented here, and um, but these are actually teardrops, and we see them. If I try and remember which way I'm going in the presentation here. I was just wondering what degree they're from. Are they from the Blue Lodge? Because they... Uh, they these would be from the third degree. Okay, teardrops. Okay. So the, the example on the right hand side there. Yep. Is actually the floor cloth that you that you, we were lo just looking at. Um. So it's okay. a wee bit easier to see what the shapes are. Okay. Well then. Um, so that, if it's not plan... tied to a specific symbol. Um. By the way, as as an aside for for my lodge, we use um slides in the edit apprentice and the fellow craft and now we're going to powerpoint and putting them on laptops and you know projecting yep. them but we've been using the same slides forever but all of the symbolism you see in the tracing board we show one by one here are the three columns here's the last i believe that's quite common i yes. believe it's, it's it's quite common um across the pond as we would say it's, it's not so common here in the uk Okay. Um, in fact, to be honest, a tracing board lecture is almost non-existent anymore in the UK. But um, when, you, when you do your lectures, do you have any kind of, is it just someone talking about the different symbols or do you actually it, have pictures or anything to show? It's just somebody talking um, with, really? one exam, with one example, uh, with one um, exception. Exception, that's the word <laughs> I'm looking for. Thank you. Um, English is not my strong point. I understand. Um, in my mother lodge, and I didn't realize this until we started looking into this, uh, or I started looking into this, my apologies. Um, for the second degree, um, we actually walk the candidate around. Yes. 
a 3D representation of the lecture, which in essence is an imaginary tracing board. Um, and we, the, the, I know there are examples of what they call walking charges. Um, I actually have a, a book there that I got recently about the walking charges. Um, but we do that in my mother lodge. And those that don't know, in Scotland, um, our ritual and the way we conduct our lodges is different from lodge to lodge. So yeah. whereas in, in America and across the world, um, the Grand Lodge of your area, your di- jurisdiction, probably dictates what your what degrees and what ritual you would be using in your lodge. And if you were to go to the lodge in the next town, it would be very similar to, to what uh, your own lodge is. England is like that. However, in Scotland, it's not like that. The ritual, we choose our own ritual. We choose our own degrees. We present them in our own way. And that's one of the things that makes Scottish Freemasonry so interesting. Um, and although they all the same, I know we spoke about this before, Chris, on the um, the the uh, Brothers in Tartan, um, Brothers in Celts lecture that we did. Um, but um, all the same principles and all the same lessons are there. They're just presented in a different way. And uh, whilst we do the walking round of the, the the lecture, other lodges just do it as a talking lecture instead. I, I'm given to understand England is the same way, though. They have variety, a great variety in their ritual. Uh, but yes, here in the U.S., the Grand Lodge, we have Virginia. I think I, I consider Virginia as a typical American Grand Lodge until people tell me otherwise. And most people generally like, yeah, that's us. Um, so I, I like to use Virginia's kind of examples. The American Grand Lodges, all of the colonies were all fairly similar. And as things spread to the West, it was lodges from Virginia that spread to led to other Grand Lodges. So there were three or four lodge, Grand Lodges that as you go West, you can see their influence as new lodge Grand Lodges were found. So that's why the American Grand Lodges are so similar is they kind of yep. came from the same model and Preston Webb greatly influenced the original one. So, uh, but we do have a Grand Lodge Committee on Work and we have individual lodge instructors and district instructors to make sure that in Virginia, at least, all the lodges follow the same ritual. We even have certifications that you get and gold cards and silver cards you can get as an instructor. So we are very, we, we care a great deal more about making sure all the lodges do it the same way. So it's the same anywhere you go in the state. So I'd be and, interested to go to take a tour of Scotland and go visit yeah. lodges as I could just to see how different they can be. <laughs> and, and what's interesting about this, um, you, you, you raise a couple of really good points there. Lodges are developing from each other and at different paces, depending on where they are. And particularly around the time that we're looking at the development of tracing boards, um, these lodges are all developing independently of each other. And then somebody might visit somewhere and see something. And that's why there's no clear progression from the, the development of the tracing board where it, you know, you're going from the drawing on the floor to the floor cloth to then raising the floor cloth onto a table to then putting it on the wall on the form of a tracing board. Um, it was all over the place um, right. with, with different lodges developing at different times. Um, and I think the, the sort of unification of all this, particularly in England, didn't really come until they started to look at the, the United Grand Lodge um, because the ritual at that time was different regardless of where you went. And as I, as I mentioned in the presentation, Brother John Brown was one of the people that was instrumental in standardising a lot of the ritual in England. Um, and without him, the, the, the development of English Freemasonry might have been very different. Yeah, uh, Brother Aday, had your hand up. You go ahead. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, for a wonderful lecture. It's well, good to see you again, Brother Adi. Uh, thank you. <laughs> so, I'm I'm just giving examples of what's done in my lodge now. My lodge, which is under the United Grand Lodge of England, uses an emulation ritual. We use three um, tracing boards. The tracing boards are displayed based on the degree that we're working in. So you start with first degree, you put it down, you display it in the center of um, 
the lodge room. You put a second tracing board on top. One is a second degree, third on top. So when you start stepping down to second, third, you keep removing them. That is the duty of the um, junior deacon. So he removes it. And then when you come in late, it also gives you a sign as to what yep. uh, sign you need to uh, uh, direct to the worshipful master before you sit down. And we've, right. we've all exper we've all experienced that where you've you've maybe come to the lodge late or you've stepped yeah. out for some reason you come back in and you can't remember what degree you're Let's, in. <laughs> I thought that was the tailor's job to tell you, but um, so no, the tailor the tailor will tell you, right? But the tailor is not in the room anyway. So oh, you're saying it might change? Well, okay, but uh, I mean, you usually go. tailor com communicates, but it's even if the tailor told you and you've forgotten, yeah, at least that yes. reminds you. Right oh. now, in in my lodge in Canada, we displayed on the wall. Mm -hmm. Right, so whether first degree, second degree, or whatever, it's just basically pictures on the wall. Now, in my UGLE lodge, um, there's a lecture for the second degree, where all the brethren gather around the uh, tracing board on the floor, and it's a very long lecture. In Canada, we use a variation of the emulation ritual. But the lecture is given by the senior ward and it's not as long. So he just points it to the wall behind him where he has a second degree. Now, in under UGLE, the master also gives an explanation of the third degree tracing board to the candidate when a candidate can't stand in front of him because we don't have uh, the altar in the middle of the lodge. It's just a pedestal that sits in front of the worshipful master. So these are sort of the variations that I... I'm, I'm used to it when it comes to tracing boards. When it's when it's on the floor, does someone have like a stick or they use a yeah, yeah, yes, laser yes. pointer? Somebody has a stick. They can yes, actually indicate. Stick. Yeah. Okay. yeah, so you indicate different things on that. You explain it. I would, I would yeah. love to have, I've asked, we have a um, very gifted, you can see my background behind me here. We have a very gifted yeah. um, artist in our lodge, a fellow named Sam Welty, who is actually master again this year for our 100th anniversary year. Um, he painted all of these murals in our lodge room and he, he does murals for a living. He paints on the sides of buildings. He's commissioned to paint huge murals uh, depicting whatever the owners want, but uh, he's done a lot of patriotic ones. There's a lot of historical ones. There are several in, we have a lot of civil war and revolutionary war um, significant areas in this, in this, in our cities. And he would paint like if there was a famous battle, he's painted a mural on sides of buildings indicating that battle, whatever. So we're lucky to have him. And I've been trying for years to get him to make new tracing boards because he has his own way. Like you tell him something and he goes off and does something. He, Scott, you can relate. He, you tell him, I need to show this, this, and this. And you have a picture in your mind. And he goes back with something that's totally alien to whatever you had in mind, but it meets the requirement. It, it's, it's what you asked him to do. He just puts it together from a certain perspective. You're like, oh my God, that's brilliant. <laughs> it's the, the, crazy it brain of an, the crazy brain of an artist at work there. That's Absolutely. what that is. <laughs> I've seen him do this before. It's like, yeah, that totally makes sense. I can't, I can't I think, argue well, with what you did, but I never would have seen that in my yeah. head. So I've been on him to do, because I give the lectures and we use the, we're, we're starting to use the, um, the projector, the laptop projector, but I'd love to have like a, a good sized tracing board to stand there and point to mm -hmm. like these were, I think they'd be more impressive on the candidate than simply. I, a I agree. I, I think so that the slideshow side of it is something that has come in and I, it was a natural development of the tracing board, I guess. It's right. not something that I include in the presentation because it's not particularly artistic, uh, but, but what brother a day saying there is, I, I think that sums up not just, to do with tracing boards, but it sums up Freemasonry so well. And when we come together in, in Zoom calls like this, I said at the start, we, we're doing something that without the pandemic probably would never have happened. I mean, I know there was a few podcasts and things, but we are learning so much about the craft of Freemasonry across the world that unless you're very, very lucky to travel the world, you don't really get to experience. Um, the... Uh, Brother Ade, what you were saying about the um, the tracing boards being displayed for the degree you're in, I believe that's quite common in America. Um, I believe it's common in Canada. 
and I believe some lodges in England do it. I've never seen it in a lodge in Scotland. Um, the more traditional or the, the, the more standard way of doing it in Scotland is that all three tracing boards are displayed at all, t- at all times on, on the wall. wall. Yep. And even if the, I mean, our hall can sometimes be used, one of the local, fit, local fitness instructors uses our, our temple, um, which is essentially just a hall. And uh, those pictures stay on the wall. Or those, those tracing board pictures stay on the wall. Because as I said before, they mean nothing to you unless you actually understand the lessons behind them. And I think that's one of the beauties of uh, tracing boards is that actually they're, they're hidden in plain sight almost. I have, um, I, I, I I have, seen, I have seen a Scottish lodge where the tracing boards are put in front of the master's uh, pedestal and they move, they move, uh, they display whatever uh, the degree they are in. Right. Do you know what, do you know what lodge that was? It's, 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 it's it was, it was basically a Scottish district in Ghana, right? right. They all okay. do that, but now they're normal under, the, under Scotland because yep. they joined with the Irish district to form the Grand Lodge of Ghana. So when right. you go in there, they still use a standard ritual uh, and have the tr- three tracing boats. They have their own regalia. Just basically do it. They use the same things. It's just that they are no longer a district under Scotland. I had one more question from the slides. If you could bring up the one that had the four Master Mason slides that were all in color. Yep. So these were all designed by Brother John Harris. No, no, the one there, that one. So go back, please. I pressed the button too many times. That's what it was. (laughs) And again, there we are. Okay, so... As I said, I, I, I follow most of what I see for the symbols. And I, if it's something I, you can't tell me, then tell me you can't tell me. <laughs> uh, but the three fives, I was trying to figure out what that meant. Because I saw that in more than one place. You had the five next to the skull and crossbones. You had five and five and then a five down at the bottom. And I, I was trying to figure out what that was. You can't, can't tell, tell me. you. Okay. <laughs> Or I don't know if you're kidding me or not. Because everything else I can relate to. Okay, that's yeah. that. That's that. That's that. Okay. It, it, it is in the ritual. Um, okay. Tell you. Maybe it's not in um, ours. Interesting. What, what, what's quite interesting about this, um, uh, something I actually forgot to mention while I was, I was talking. Um, I, I spoke about the skirt, which I, I, I know a lot of lodges don't use the skirt as a right. tool. Um, if you look at each of these, uh, the three with the coffins, the top of the coffin, there is three tools displayed. You've got the compasses, which is quite obvious. Um, you've got what is probably a uh, pencil. And on the left-hand side, you have a skirt. Yep. Um, and you can actually see, it. I think the, the 1825 one's probably the clearest, where you can actually see the line coming down from it. And we, we uh, my... There's a, a bit of a joke that gets played on some of the new office bearers in uh, my my lodge. And um, usually there's a knot tied in the line so that you can pull out the line and you can actually um, sort of pull it taut while, while you're, you're giving the presentation on the working tool. And as you pull it taut, it stops because there's a knot tied in it. Uh, but one of the tricks that we like to play on somebody that's never done it for the first time is we take the knot out so that when they pull it taut, they pull it and it goes over, it, it just flies off the, the skirt and they, you end up with lying all over the place. Now, we don't tend to do it during the actual degree because that wouldn't be fair on the candidate, but it, it's a, a, a little prank that usually gets played at one of the rehearsals on the lead up to the, the degree. Well, I wanted to point out something else. And this is one of the things I've learned in my, my journey here is uh, interacting, especially with British and Scottish brothers is how like Royal Arch is, it's kind of the same, but it's organized differently depending on where you are. Yeah. And uh, I actually give a talk on the cryptic degrees and how that's different everywhere. But if you look at the, the 1850 slide and the um, uh, stone on the left, yeah. all of those symbols I recognize from the Royal Arch degree. And then you see a couple of them below the skull and crossbones in each one. 
So mm-hmm. you have UD looks like, and then UE, and then UC, UC. And then of course, more of them, and they're all on the left. So that's directly out of the Royal Arch degree. Yep. I found that quite interesting to see it here. And it may so have the, the same symbolism, it may not. But mm-hmm. it, it probably does. Um, okay. It probably does, because as, as you say, uh, Brother Chris, the, the, the way that we are sort of mark and the, the way we, we transition to, to Royal Arch is, is very different over here yes. compared to, to the way that you would do it in, um, on your side. Okay. What was quite interesting here as well, the 1845 tracing board, that's actually the first example. And today we would expect to see a scroll of some point of some sort on, on a third degree tracing board. This is the very first example of it. Um, it. It doesn't appear on any third degree tracing board prior to this. And it, again, it then became a sort of standard after this. Huh. Um, what's, what's also interesting about Harris from that point on, the three working tools um, or the three tools were always laid at the, the foot of the coffin and they were always laid in uh, two groups, a group of one or one and then a group of two. Um, and sometimes that's a good way of spotting whether something, a, a tracing board is an actual Harris board or actually just a, a board that's been done in the style of Harris because Harris always grouped them that way whereas other artists have come afterwards and copied Harris, tend to center one of the tools on in the middle so that you end up with an even spacing. Right. Um, it's just little things like that. You, you, you tend to spot through time. as you. The more I give this presentation, the more I start to spot things. Um, but yeah, bro- Brother John Harris, for anyone that's interested in tracing boards, he is definitely the, the artist to look at because... Um, he he was the one that that sort of um, made made huge artistic improvement on them, and as I say, sort of standardised them across um, a, across the world almost. Indeed. Uh, any other questions, brothers? I don't want to hog you too much here, but <laughs> there was a lot there to take in. Any brother have questions? I usually get lots of questions about I know, the. I know. I usually Gordon get lots of questions about the Karmic manuscript. Uh, do, you have, do you have any books you'd recommend um, going in, more into trestle board or tracing board? I mean, there's, there's very few that are actually available um, in print at the moment. Um, this would be one that I would recommend. This is tracing boards of the three degrees in craft masonry. It's by Julian Rees. Uh, my apologies, I'll just cancel no, no. out of this. I just, I just put it back on view. Yeah, you should. You know. uh, there we go. Right. No. Um, this one? Yeah. Okay. Um, it's by Julian Reese, um, who I think there's a bit of controversy around, unless I'm thinking of somebody different. I don't want to speak out of turn about somebody that has written a very good book, um, I should say. Um, it's very interesting. There's lots and lots of diagrams of it, various tracing boards. So that's tracing boards of the three degrees and craft Freemasonry explained. Um, there are other examples in the AQC. Um, oh, hello, Gordon. <laughs> uh, Gordon Mitchie uh, has just put in, yes, he resigned from UGLE and joined um, another organization. How do you spell um, that last name of the author? Uh, Reese R E E S. Okay, thank you. I hope you're well, Brother Gordon. It's good to see you. Um, so that's a good book. There's also the AQC books. Um, they they've got some very good um, bits on on tracing boards and the development of tracing boards. Um, and I'm also happy, as I say, if you if you drop me your email address, I'd be more than happy to send through. Um, my presentation and the, the, the sort of script I have for it, if you like, which you can use that as the basis of any any research that you would like to, to do yourself. And where 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 would we send that? Uh, you said in in the chat at the in the chat at the moment, or I can give you my email address. Um, my email address is the Masonic Artist. All one word, the Masonic Artist at gmail.com. 
And if you send me an email, I'd be more than happy to send through um, a copy of the presentation so that you can you can use that for uh, for your own purposes. Thank you. Christian, do you have a question? Or are you just waving? <laughs> I, th I think he's heading off. Brother Christian, thank you so much for being here. And yeah, thank you very much, Brother Scott. I really appreciate the presentation. I was hoping to hear something about uh, the tracing boards, and uh, you did a really great job. So thank you very much. I have to thank leave. You. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for joining us, brother. And as I mentioned at the beginning, this will be uh, recorded. Well, it is being recorded. It will be published to YouTube. Um, and that'll be available. Um, if you're not already, um, I think most of you already are on my uh, mailing list, <laughs> but if you're not, please feel contract, contact me and join our Facebook group, but I will put links to, um, uh, the video when it's available and other upcoming events. I do want to go ahead and announce our upcoming events. Give me one sec. I've just noticed a, a couple, yeah. sorry, uh, Chris, just before you, yeah. you carry on, I've just noticed a couple of interesting questions here from and comments from gordon yeah um, gordon's uh, gordon's mic isn't working so yeah his, his mic's not working but um he's he's put um in his lodge lodge earl hague 1260 um we have the the three boards and they're changed for every degree so very similar to what brother um a day was 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 talking about earlier and they sit to the right of the master and this is very common in lodges in the east of scotland which i didn't know um, so in the west of Scotland, there's obviously a difference there between the west and the east of Scotland. And, and unfortunately, I haven't been in any any lodges on the east of Scotland yet. So hopefully after the pandemic, I'll be able to go and visit. Uh, and Gordon will be one of the, uh, Gordon's lodge will be one of the ones on the list, I'm, I'm very sure. Yes. Um, if I can quickly announce, Brother Day's getting ready to leave. We may have already left. He already did. Okay. Um, just upcoming Next Saturday is May 15th, so if you are in the Virginia area or if it's in driving distance, you're more than welcome to join us, but we will have our first actual meeting of Virginia Research Lodge in person since February of 2020. So it has been over a year, uh, unfortunately, and uh, all of the officers stayed in place, so I'm still junior deacon. I get another year to try and get it right, um, and the master's got another year to do it right. Um, but uh, we will be meeting in person on May 15th. And we actually have a presentation on um, the grand musician of the grand chapter of Virginia and the grand commander of Virginia. But he'll be giving a, a talk on two different uh, Masonic um, um, pieces of music. And this should be quite interesting. Plus, it's our district deputy's official visit. Uh, so we will not be having a Zoom meeting next week because we have a stated. But we'll resume after that. Um, and I swear I had the 22nd in here. I'm sorry. I'm looking, I'm looking at Facebook and it's not there. Give me one sec. Um, I do have a record of upcoming Zooms. Um, let's say I thought I'd usually put them out on Facebook. Uh, okay. Yes. Brother Gordon Mitchie, who is unable to speak. Hopefully he'll be able to speak then. Um, he will be our guest speaker on May the 22nd. That's in two weeks. He will speak on Freemasonry and the Victoria Cross. And then May the 29th will be Brother Wes Latchford, who's a member of my lodge, Ocean View, and a member of my Scottish Rite. And he will be speaking on Brother David Vinton, who is the author of the Masonic Dirge, Solemn Strikes the Funeral Chime, which we play, which we uh, say, we sing out loud during the second section of the Master Masons. Um, and so I was always, I've always been interested in that, um, in that song and then the song we say at the beginning of the uh, Master Masons degree. So it'll be very interesting to have, uh, hear bro Brother Latchford has to say about that. And just looking ahead, June 5th, I will have a brother, D.D. D. Anderson, and a few others who will be talking about the Scottish Rite Supreme Council that exists in the state of Louisiana. This is a Scottish Rite body that is technically clandestine to me and to the Scottish Rite, 
of Southern Jurisdiction, which I belong to, um, they actually confer all of the degrees. Uh, it's common, and I know the Brits are like, what are you talking about? Uh, in America, typically, the Scottish Rite is only an independent body, much like the Royal Arch being a continuation is an independent body of the York Rite Lodge that we are. The Scottish Rite in other parts of the world confers the first, the three craft degrees. In America, they do not. In the state of Louisiana, they do. So there is a Scottish Rite of Louisiana, Supreme Council, only in the state of Louisiana, but they actually have branched out into other states now. And it'll be very interesting to hear their history. That'll be on June the 5th. So as always, we have interesting things coming up about um, masonry on this channel. Just I'm trying to get as, as various speakers as I can find, and I appreciate those who come out. But uh, always something interesting coming up. So please stay tuned to our group, and we'll keep you informed on that. Oh, I have one quick question, uh, Brother Scott. Do you know of any other Masonic bodies besides the Symbolic Lodge that employ trust awards? Ooh. As I say, that I mean my my experience outside of craft Freemasonry is quite limited, um, okay. because being on a small island, we, we literally just have our craft right. lodge. That is it. Um, so my my experience is very limited. I'm not aware of. I'm aware of various orders throughout um, Maso with Masonic connections, etc. They each have their own tracing boards. Um, for example, there is a, a Mark Master tracing board, there is a Mark okay. Degree tracing board, all these kind of things. And the Royal Arch, the various degrees that will have tracing boards they that, do. that go through them. Okay. Um, and there's not really been a lot written about them. Um, certainly not that I found, although I tend to shy away from it because I don't know that much about it. So whenever I come across something like that, I tend to just put it to one side and say okay. it's not really what I'm interested in. Um but yeah, I mean the, the 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 tracing boards that we've looked at today are literally a scratch on the surface of what is out there. There are there's so many different types, um, just for the craft degrees. Never mind anything else. Um, but yeah, the the other other orders and other um, various degrees within them tend to have their own tracing boards. They do. Okay, because I never I, I didn't think about this until. Well, we were talking about this, it, it occurred to me, um, because I would say what makes, especially the Royal Arch and the Scottish Rite and the Commander as well, um, they have, we confer degrees and typically it's in costume and it's usually in the form of a play of sorts. And that's where all of the symbol, you don't actually describe the symbolism very much, like in the Scottish Rite. There are all sorts of things on the table, on the altar, when you're getting your obligation. They're not talked about. They're not explained. You have to go read, you have to go read Albert Pike to understand yes. what all the symbolism is. Whereas in the Blue Lodge, you have a lecture with each degree. Mm -hmm. You could argue there are, um, like the camp talk within the 32nd degree, um, is a lecture of sorts, and it's in the middle of a degree. So you don't have the same structure in the appendant bodies you do in the Blue Lodge, where here's the degree... Now, here's a lecture that explains more about it. So there's a need for the tracing boards to help visually explain all of the symbolism of that degree. It's different in the appended bodies. So they may be, that's why I find it unusual that they actually have tracing boards. I'm sure they can. I'm sure there's plenty of symbols they can point to and talk about. But I just have, I haven't experienced any here. So I think it's I think it's a shame that as a whole Freemasonry has sort of moved away from tracing boards. Mm -hmm. um, whilst there are jurisdictions that still use them and still, and I know in America a master's carpet is still a thing. Mm -hmm. um, that's what a, equivalent of a floor cloth, I believe. And you would stand in front of the master's carpet with the, the stick and sort of point out the various bits and pieces. Um, but I think Freemasonry worldwide in general, have started to move away from these types of presentations. And I think it's a shame because we know so much about people nowadays and how how we learn things. Some people learn things by repetition. Some people learn it by hearing it. Some people learn it by seeing it. Some people learn it by doing it. Um, and 
listening to a lecture such as that in the second degree, which is a very long lecture, um, the candidate doesn't take very much of it in. I mean, it's it's unrealistic to expect the candidate to take all that in. Um, whereas if it's presented visually, then they might actually take a bit more of that in. Um, so I, I do actually think it's a shame that a lot of lodges have moved away from from using tracing boards in this fashion. Um, whether there will ever be a, a resurgence of them again, I don't know. Um, I think it would actually take artists to start designing interesting new designs for tracing boards for them to pick up a little bit more interest and, and maybe be be used at the front um, the front and centre again. Right. But um, it would certainly help a lot of people I know understand some of the, the symbols um, if they could actually see it as a reminder. Right. Um, because I, I've, I've spoken to a few fellow Freemasons that are um, way more experienced than myself, shall we say, um, and they didn't know some of the, the various aspects of the tracing board just because it's never actually been taught to them or never been brought up in a, in a conversation. Um, you know, so I think there's always something we can learn. As detailed as they are, because we're sitting here in this medium, you can put them up in PowerPoint and we can see them. If you had to zoom in, you could, and we could see them in great detail. If they're on a wall, I'm trying to think about the point where you're presenting it to the candidate. If you're given a lecture and you're pointing to things on a tracing board, if it's on the wall, he'd have to stand fairly close to actually see the detail. Yeah. Now he could go up to it afterwards and look at it and pick out the individual items and say, Oh, right. That's the, okay. That's, that's the lamb. That's this, but it have to be large enough for him to see it while you're presenting. That's why in the, um, with the slideshows, it's good size. You see one image at a time. Okay. That's a beehive. I can take that in, but I think it's kind of like, that's why I wanted these stand up ones that's like on an easel that I could point to as I'm walking through it with and the candidate would hear me walking through it and pointing and then he could go into it afterwards and look at it and remember what he heard and that would help him remember but it has to be large enough that he can be standing six or more feet away from me and everyone else in the room could follow along and it'd be close enough it'd have to be large enough for him to see it in detail so it is kind of a hard way to express it has to be big enough to be seen but small enough that you can, can conceivably use it and put it away. So I mean, I now, know. That, now that we're all having Zoom meetings and things and yep. Freemasonry has, has progressed into the, the 21st century, um, we might actually start to see VR headsets for, for tracing boards in the future. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> but then again, we can't write it down. I mean, that's the thing. It's like I could show a tracing board. I, I can certainly take any of the ones you've presented and put it up in a Zoom meeting and I could give the lecture and use my laser pointer and point to things. But I can't do a lecture online because that's I know. so and it's that's, kind of hard. <laughs> I, I find it difficult sometimes finding a balance between what I can actually talk about and what I can't. Um, I know. You could probably go into a lot of detail on just the first degree tracing board. Yes. But you, then, you ruin it for anyone that's then, and I know Brother Christian's um, has left now, but it, you're very cautious of, A, not revealing anything that you shouldn't, but B, right. you don't want to you don't want to ruin the experience of what is to come for oh, any brother that's that's not reached that that level yet. So, um, I'm always very cautious of those kind of things. Um, it was very difficult in a recent presentation I did on the form of the lodge mm -hmm. because you want to explain why we do certain things, but you can't I explain it without giving anything away. So, that was yep. quite a difficult one. That's the dilemma. Okay. Any other brother have questions? I think we did good. Oh, thank you very much, it. though. Thank you, very brother. Interesting. Yes. I appreciate you all coming out. And thank you again, brother Scott. That was a wonderful presentation. I felt like I was touring an art museum. This is wonderful, but it actually had Masonic meaning to it. So it was great. I really enjoyed that. Um, and I want to go find more of these images. There are, some of them are quite impressive. And there's a lot of detail. I want to go back later and study them. So thank you all for coming out, and we'll see you in two weeks. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.